Welcome everyone, I'm Justin Paperni with Prison Professors. Thank you so much for joining us. I understand some of you may be watching this on our Prison Professors YouTube channel, others on our Prison Professors podcast. Regardless of where you are, thank you. We wanna help and educate you on what can be a very difficult process. And specifically what we're gonna talk about, or what I'm gonna discuss in this video today is a pre-charge plea agreement, something that I know exceptionally well because I signed a pre-charge plea agreement. So let's just go through some background by way of a blog uh, that our team wrote on the Prison Professors website. I encourage you to visit prisonprofessors.com. We have a plethora of content from blogs to videos to free books, including a copy of Earning Freedom written by my, my business partner, Michael Santos. So we give away a ton of, of content. What you need to do is invest the time Time to learn and hold people that you hire, including your lawyer or our team or anybody, accountable. For clarity, a pre-charge plea agreement happens prior to an indictment or form, formal charges, uh, and there, you know, it, there is a lot of benefits perhaps to perhaps to a pre-indictment plea agreement uh, that I'm going to discuss. A quick benefit uh, to a it's hard to say even to a pre-charge plea agreement, you don't go through the formal process of, of, of having the, the prosecutor go in front of a grand jury and get indicted. And in my case, as the case of many of our clients, you don't run the risk of having, in a lot of cases, agents coming to arrest you at 6 a.m. with the guns and the dogs and the helicopters and everything that accompanies an arrest. I understand in some cases, to be clear, you can still be go through that process of getting arrested at 6 a.m. and then posting bond and eventually signing a plea agreement. But in some instances, once you've learned that you've become the target of an investigation uh, by way of the FBI showing up on your front door or, or leaving a, a letter, you can have some more leverage if you're convinced that you're not guilty. If you're convinced that you shouldn't go to trial, there may be some value in getting your case off of the government's desk as quickly as possible. That was a benefit to me or a client with whom our team recently began working. He called and he said, I did it. Any way you rationalize it, I did it. I broke the law. The FBI just showed up at my home. I don't even have money to go to trial, but what's the point of spending every last dollar on a lawyer or going to trial? I know I did it. I'll never prevail. I would like to discuss a pre-indictment plea agreement. What are the benefits of that? And again, those are things I'm gonna to touch, touch on in, in this video. As many of you would expect, it should be no surprise to, to you, whether you're listening or watching, that the majority of cases in this country are handled by way of a plea agreement, whether it's in the investigation stage and you sign it before you formally been indicted, or even if you've been indicted, the majority of people plead guilty. As I understand it, more than 92% of cases result in, in a plea agreement, which means the majority of these people are not going to, to, to trial. So few people go to trial, so few people prevail. There is the unfortunate reality and something that we've learned at Prison Professors over a very long time now, that there are some people who will plead guilty, who don't really believe that they're guilty, who believe that they, um, the case should have been handled civilly, or they don't think an indictment should have been brought, or at worst case, a civil sanction, as I just mentioned. So it's difficult for a number of people to sign a plea agreement, even in the pre-charge phase, because they're not convinced the charges are correct. The unfortunate reality is once you become immersed in this system, as studies show, as data, as data shows of how many people are convicted at trial, how many people sign a plea agreement, the odds of prevailing are so low. So as a strategy, our team is not lawyers, though we've worked with a lot of lawyers and you have to make decisions that's best for you and your family. There are some defendants who will waste millions or hundreds of thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars going through discovery and the whole rigmarole, I'm going to trial, I'm going to prevail, I'm going to trial. And on the eve of trial, they may actually sign a plea agreement. And in so doing, they've spent a lot of money and in many cases, everything they have left. They've delayed the healing that could have begun sooner. They've lived with a great deal of stress and anxiety during this time, because if you're listening to this video or watching this video, you know that, as I've said a lot, Tom Petty said, waiting is the hardest part. The waiting and wondering is very hard, and it can be stretched out many, many years if you're planning to, to go to trial. And, and lastly, a, a potential result of waiting so long to plead guilty, and this has happened to clients of ours at Prison Professors and our sister company, White Collar Advice, the government can then say, yes, your honor, he did plead guilty or she pled guilty. 
However, he waited so long to plead guilty. He had the government invest so many resources and so much time and so much energy of the precious resources of this U.S. attorney's office. So while he pled guilty, we don't think he should get the full reduction warranted because he waited so long in the process to do it. So you've got to understand that every decision you make matters. How quickly you accept responsibility if you did it matters. The more resources the government invests in your case matters. The longer this goes on as you threaten potentially to go to trial, the more they could argue why you're worthy of a longer prison term. And that has actually happened to uh, a number of our cases. Now we do a lot of federal work, but of course state work and uh, the, the statistics are very much the same for pre-charge plea agreements in, in state cases. In fact, as referenced in this article, our colleague wrote in 2012, the New York Times reported that 97% of federal cases and 94% of state cases end up via a plea bargain. I mean, that's a really big, that's a really big number. The government loves low hanging fruit and the majority of the time, because the sanction is so severe, if you go to trial, the majority of people, even those who don't believe their conduct was criminal, will unfortunately sign a plea agreement. Now, what are some benefits of signing this plea, especially in the, the pre-indictment phase? Well, I mentioned a few moments ago, in my case, a lot of our cases, the FBI showed up in my home. I learned that I was under investigation. I was proactive in retaining a lawyer. They could see that I was taking this seriously, and I immediately engaged in settlement discussions. That helped me avoid the embarrassment of shame of getting ripped out of my home at 6 a.m. after the U.S. attorney formally went to a grand jury and got an indictment and the whole process of going to a county jail and getting bonded out. In some cases, it could take a week or two to get out of that jail, depending on what's taking place. So a benefit to the pre-charge plea was I was able, the government could see that I was taking this seriously. They would see that you were taking it seriously. So these are things I need you to think about. Of course, if you're fully innocent, and if I have frequently said, if you go to trial, you must be innocent or you're insane, but you must be innocent because the odds of prevailing are so incredibly low. So if you go to trial, we support you. We want you to be successful. We also want you to know the odds of prevailing together with the benefits of taking a pre-charge plea agreement. And one of the deals, of course, one of the benefits, of course, is you're they're going to offer a reduced sentence potentially. So because the government's not going to have as many or as much resources invested in you, uh, because they favor people, they reward people who accept responsibility, you may have an opportunity to cooperate. You're going to have a higher likelihood to cooperate if it's earlier in the investigation, if they find you that you're truthful and you're cooperative and you're remorseful and you're not obstructing and making matters worse for them. So besides the three point, two to three points you may get in your plea agreement, federally speaking, for accepting responsibility and doing it earlier in the process, you get to the healing more quickly. You get a better you're going to get a better outcome. So while you forfeit a lot of your rights, once you sign that agreement, your, your right to an appeal, you're going to be a, a convicted felon. You may have to unfortunately sign some things in a plea agreement you don't totally agree with. You've got to understand there are pros and cons to everything you do. But odds are if you sign a plea agreement and you're cooperative and you don't obstruct justice, you can expect to get a more favorable outcome. And of course, if you went to trial or even if you went drag this out for a long long time when do a lot of these plea agreements take place in my case i was i learned that i was investigate and under investigation in april 2005 and i didn't actually sign my plea agreement until february 2007 this investigation went on for some time in july of 06 my lawyer joel athey told the u.s attorney david willingham that yes justin would like to accept a plea agreement in this case we are waiting on the government to get back to us they have a lot of cases a lot of things in that u.s attorney's office i was in the central district so we were kind of waiting on them so we were as proactive as we could possibly be but they knew that i was selling real estate that i wasn't breaking the law that i was compliant they weren't necessarily worried that i had to immediately be confined or plead guilty so i was our team was as proactive as you can be. We have a, a new client now in New York where it is unfortunately going to, to turn criminal. It's already a Securities and Exchange Commission matter. And the U.S. attorney who's aware of this said, thank you. Are we aware that you'd like to sign a plea agreement? We're busy. We, we'll get back to you. It could be three months, could be six months, could be nine months. As long as our client is proactive, as long as you're proactive in these pre-indictment phases, you're doing everything that you can do. The U.S. attorney's office may, may be busy. To the timing, certainly you can sign the, the plea agreement before formal charges or a grand a jury indictment. Any time after the indictment, naturally before trial, as I mentioned a couple of moments ago, it is 
probably more advantageous if you know you're guilty and you can't, you, you're not going to prevail at trial to do it as quickly as possible. If not, you're spending a lot of money on legal fees, you're delaying the healing that could be good sooner, and you're going to make the U.S. Attorney's Office irate and potentially ask for a longer plea, a longer prison term, even if you uh, plead guilty. We have had some clients actually plead guilty dur during, the, during the actual trial. Very interesting cases why that actually happened. One time it involved a government informant who was uncooperative and the judge said this person is incredible and it kind of weakened the government's case. And in so doing, the, my, our clients saw an opportunity to sign a plea agreement, albeit with much reduced charges because the government star witness was weakened and kind of beaten down. So he ended up signing the plea agreement. He still went to prison, albeit a much shorter sentence than would have been the case had he gone to trial. I think in that case, he contemplating letting it go all the way to trial or letting the trial conclude because this witness had struggled so much. But of course, the odds are still against him. The odds are that he would have lost. So for that reason, he took a plea agreement during the, the trial. And I think it was a real win-win both for our client and, uh, and the government. As we wrote in this article, pre-charge pre or pre-indictment plea agreements typically take place uh, before there is a grand jury, grand jury indictment or formal charge. While the specific criminal procedures can differ between federal and state, both systems offer the opportunity to negotiate pre-charge or pre-indictment plea deals. Given the right to be indicted by a grand jury, defendants wishing to enter a pre-charge or pre-indictment guilty plea must waive indictment. Look, if there's one thing I'll stress from this pre-charge plea agreement video or podcast that you're listening to, it's to become introspective, to invest the time, to fully understand what you did, to recognize that major a lot of people don't view their actions as criminal or believe that they crossed criminal lines, yet you have to approach it from the perspective of the stakeholders from a federal judge or a probation officer or a prosecutor in many cases is out to advance their career. They have their own agenda and will cons construe or in some cases misconstrue their own facts to kind of square peg round hole. So it's frustrating when our team gets calls from defendants who have been convicted at trial, still defiant yet sometimes down the road will say, I kind of see how the government got there. In retrospect, I wish I better understood the cynicism. I wish I better understood how they're out for vengeance. And I wish I didn't serve seven years under that plea because I was convicted at trial. I'd have probably got two if I pled guilty. So that's like the main decision. You kind of cut your losses. You're going to most likely get a better deal. You are going to get a better deal if you don't go to trial. But it doesn't change the... Um, the frustration that accompanies this process. Oftentimes in pre-charge plea agreements, there could be an opportunity to cooperate. We have had some clients at prison professors and white collar advice who cooperated for two or three years before they formally signed the plea agreement. Uh, they didn't want it to get out. Uh, eventually when they pled guilty, it was kept under seal. But there were cases where clients cooperated extensively before they formally signed that plea. And then when they signed the plea, it could still take two, three or four years before that person is even sentenced. As an example, the very popular Varsity Blues college admissions case, it's August 25th today, 2021, 30 or 40 parents in that case have been sentenced. Most have already served their prison term. Yet Rick Singer, the mastermind, has yet to be sentenced. Why? He signed a pre-charge uh, agreement. So while parents in that case, like Felicity Huffman, were arrested at 6 a.m. and pulled out of their homes with home or home with guns and helicopters and 15 FBI agents, Rick Singer was resting comfortably in his home in Orange County because he was cooperating. He had agreed to plead guilty and he didn't have to go through that massive, uh, frankly, embarrassing and difficult process. Things I need you to think about as we approach uh, sentencing issues. Uh, let me say whether a pre-charge or pre-indictment agreement can include binding sentencing terms. They will vary in federal and state uh, cases. In federal cases, the judge ultimately decides on the appropriate sentence and is not bound by any agreement between the parties. In other words, the guidelines are just that, guidelines. They're advisory. Uh, on our Prison Professor's uh, YouTube channel and in our podcast, we have uh, interviewed a number of judges, but two of them had the courage to come on our channel, Judge Boo and Judge Bennett. I will remind you uh, exactly as I just read the the judge has discretion. They are guidelines. And Judge Boo, I believe, told us the guidelines are only that. They're numbers on a page. They don't reflect the humanity, the background 
of, of, of the defendant. So that's a great opportunity for all of you, knowing that even though your, your lawyer is going to make a recommendation and the prosecutor is going to make a recommendation, the majority of the time, the judge is going to use his mind or her mind to make a decision on what's best, what the best sentence is. And that comes down to why you need to begin mitigating as quickly as possible. I'm flabbergasted. I'm aghast when a defendant will say, hey, I, I just got a Wells letter from the Securities Exchange Commission, or I, I learned that I'm under federal investigation. My lawyer told me that I should wait to prepare. Think about how insane that is. It wasn't too early to get indicted. It wasn't too early to give a six figure or not even indicted in some cases. How about the U.S. attorney, an FBI agent show with a target letter? Wasn't too early for the target letter. Wasn't too early to retain a lawyer. Wasn't too early for the SEC or Department of Justice to issue scathing Department of Justice press releases. Yet in some cases, defendants are told it's too early to begin preparing. I don't know anyone successful that waits or delays potentially the inevitable. So if there is a chance you're going to sign a plea agreement and go to trial, there's a chance you're going to face a sentencing hearing. The day to begin preparing is now you have to work. You have to create a new record. You have to do authentic community service work. You should be learning how to hold your lawyer accountable. You should be creating content at the right time that can influence these stakeholders uh, that I that I mentioned earlier. So what you cannot do, it's one thing to listen to this video or podcast. It's one thing to watch the video. It's another thing to actually implement it. I'll put up a screen share in this video where a defendant emailed to say, my guidelines were 30 to 39 months. I got three months because I watched your videos. I read your blogs. I read your books. This person didn't even retain our team. The point is, he listened, he followed the guidance, he heard what federal judges had to say in the pre-indictment phase, in the pre, you know, in this earlier process, and he got a great deal. Learn from him. But if you're going to watch these videos and listen to these podcasts, you have got to take action, begin preparing, begin preparing for the worst possible scenario. Let's conclude. And of course, you should know our team is available. If you'd like to, to speak, simply visit prisonprofessors.com, click the button to schedule a free call will be of great value to you. To conclude, any criminal defendant, state or federal, must carefully weigh their options when the opportunity to negotiate a plea agreement presents itself. Some people regret waiting too long to sign that plea agreement because other people in the case may have jumped ahead of them. People who were even less culpable or more culpable than them jumped ahead of them, signed a plea, began to cooperate. Then eventually when the defendant who delayed signs the plea agreement, when that, that person who pleads later asks the U.S. attorney, can I cooperate or what can I do? The U.S. attorney may say, you're too late. We're already speaking to other people in the case. And that's why some people who are more culpable can get a shorter prison term because of that cooperation. That was actually what was going to happen in my case. You've got to be very aware of everything that you're doing. And if you know that you've done it and you're not going to prevail, you've got to assess, is it worth spending three months, six months or a year going through discovery? I had a tough time saying that going through discovery that's simply going to discover that you broke the law and in so doing, you're spending a lot of time on lawyer fees and you're just delaying the inevitable and you're going to get a longer uh, prison term. Um, the odds that the case will be resolved through you know, plea through plea negotiations down the road in any event. So I'm wrapping up here. You can plead most likely at any time, even through trial. As I conclude, I want you to know, I want you to consider as you're holding your lawyer accountable and assessing what's best for you and your family. If you've done it and you are you got the thumb of the U.S. government on your neck and they're coming, I want you to fully consider everything I've said in this video. Weigh the pros and cons of signing a plea agreement earlier in the process. And if you can do that, you're at least going to be informed. Even if you don't make the right decision, even if you choose to go down a different path, at least you're going to know. At least you're going to have the pros and cons. At least you'll be more informed. And that's what our team strives to do at Prison Professors. We want to educate. We want to inform. We want to inspire. And if, God forbid, prison is part of a sanction, we want you to be prepared. And that's how I'll close. Go to prisonprofessors.com. Grab a free copy of Earning Freedom written by my business partner, Michael Santos, who served 26 consecutive years in prison. Learn the strategies he put in place to thrive. And while you're there, schedule a call with our team. I am Justin Paprini with Prison Professors, and it is my privilege to come into your home by way of a video or this podcast. I look forward to returning soon. Bye-bye.